Welcome to Mostly Minutia. I'm Colleen Lindell, and this is episode 35, Make Space. I kind of struggled with naming this episode. Uh, I was going back and forth between give space and create space and hold space. And then this episode and the next few episodes, they all kind of surround those titles. But I finally settled on make space because I ultimately I think that that is the thread that's going to pull us through this story. And I I hope that you end up agreeing with me in some respect. Um, Or if you have you know, a different idea of a different thread that that is more of the theme, let me know. Um, So uh, what I want to do now is just pause for a second. Because you guys, we made it to 2018. Happy 2018. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a lot of momentum behind this year. I'm feeling like, um, a sort of lifting off of the heaviness, a bit more spring in my step. Um, For me, I'm feeling much more ambition than I had in the last 12 months. And I'm also feeling like taking risks a bit more, maybe perhaps reaching out to some people that I've wanted to interview on my show, but I've been, you know, didn't have the nerve to ask because what if I'm not good enough? What if I don't ask the right questions? What if I am not intelligent enough to keep the conversation going the whole time. Things like that. Um, These old roadblocks and obstacles, they're kind of like relics for me and they're kind of like crumbling relics that I just want to sidestep around and step up into occasions that come across my path. Even if it means stepping a little bit outside of my comfort zone because how am I supposed to grow if I don't step out of my comfort zone. And I kind of feel like being uncomfortable a little bit. I kind of feel like being stretched and and trying, just trying. That's that's like all we have to do, right? We just have to try. You have an idea, just try it. Why not? What are the chances that I'm going to fail? And what are the chances that I am going to succeed? What are the chances that I will feel more awesome because I tried or am at least trying. So 2018 is the year of dreams and dreams being realized is what I'm thinking. And with that, I just want to say for this show, Mostly Minutia, um, in 2017, I felt led to interview people who I considered to be door openers or um, people who opened doors for others to walk through before they themselves walk through. People who let others' lights shine without the fear that it would in some way dim or take away from their own light. This year, 2018, I feel the words listening and holding space are like my guiding words for this year of this podcast. And specifically listening by holding a space for others to be themselves and let their hair down, so to speak. And I really hope that I can provide a space like this for my guests. And I feel this specific episode kind of ushers us into that. So episode 35, Make Space. This episode is actually a story I followed for a year. Kristen Huffman, who you are about to meet, she and I interviewed in August of 2015. And at the time, this show had been in existence for, I think, one month and Kristen was literally the second person I ever interviewed. So you will be hearing some microphone noises. Sorry about that. At the time we interviewed, I barely knew Kristen. Uh, Kristen was my dance instructor in a class called Yoga Booty Ballet. Yes, Yoga Booty Ballet, or um, we call it YBB for short. And YBB is like a 80s, 90s flash dance meets Katy Perry meets Cyndi Lauper meets Beyonce. I don't exactly know how to explain it, but what I can say is that the first time I took the class, I cried, and subsequently, every class thereafter, I felt like I was breaking down walls, um, emotional walls, societal walls, and Kristen being the teacher was a huge part of that because each class, uh, we'd all start sitting on the floor She would welcome all of us. She then would ask us if there was anyone who had a celebration or anyone who needed support. And one by one, people in the class would open up and talk about um, some really difficult things like 
their battles with cancer or their breakups um, or a lot of hopeful things too, like promotions or their niece that was just born. And then Kristen would ask us to declare an intention for the class or sometimes she would ask us to dedicate our dance to someone or something that we'd like to dance for. So at the time Kristen and I interviewed, I really, I knew nothing about her life. I sheerly wanted to interview her based on the impact that she had in my life. And I had heard that she would be moving to New York soon. So at the time, I didn't know exactly why I was interviewing her. I just knew my time to get her story was short and I needed to capture it before I never saw her again. So I thought, great, we'll talk for an hour. We're going to have this hour long discussion. She's going to tell me about where she grew up, how she got into dance, and then um, and then that'll be the end. And we did do all of that, which you'll hear soon. But about two thirds through our conversation, I asked her a really simple question. I just asked her to tell me about her upcoming move to New York. And she shares this very private, very tender, very sweet story with me. I just want to play the sound clip for you. Here's Kristen. So my intentions have become progressively stronger as I've become stronger over the years. And the last couple of years I've called in. uh, This is so personal. I can't believe I'm sharing this, but I've just called in, you know, the next chapter. I've wanted to call in my partner and my family, my future family. Like, how did you call in your partner? I first started praying for him. And when I say praying, I mean, I believe that we are all embodiments of something really profound. I believe that we are all divine. And I believe in a quote unquote God. And whether you call that setting intention or meditating or praying or connecting to your higher self or tapping into the collective consciousness whatever you want to call that, when you're plugging into being a channel of love and like letting that divine goodness flow through you, that's the ultimate. So I just started focusing on him wherever he was in the world, doing what he needed to do to be ready for me and then calling in the work that I needed to be doing for him. And so I would just send him little blessings, like little wishes, like wherever you are, I love you. I know you're finding your way to me. And there were definitely times when I was like, oh, man, I don't know if this will ever happen for me. I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Am I cut out for this to be married and like start a family? I don't know. Maybe maybe there's a reason I haven't found that yet. And then I just made a decision to believe in him. So Kristen shares this story with me. And of course, I immediately had dozens of questions for her. I felt like, wait a second, we're at the end of this interview, but I feel like the real story has just begun. And when I asked Kristen if I could follow her for a year through the embarking and the process of this journey, she graciously obliged. So this is a three-part story. The first part you'll hear right now, and this is really the act where you'll get to meet Kristen and learn about her as a person. You will hear that same sound clip that I just played for you about two thirds through. The second time I interviewed Kristen was nine months into her relationship, and that'll be part two. And then the third part takes place in New York, where I catch up to Kristen 12 months into her journey. Parts two and three will be released in the next two episodes. A huge thank you to Kristen for opening and sharing her life with me for an entire year. Please enjoy meeting and getting to know Kristen Huffman. What brought you to Los Angeles? Mm. I had a dream, like a dream, like an overnight dream. It was the actual dream that was very clear and it was like, go. All I can tell you is that there were certain visuals, like the hills, and I knew that they were either like the Hollywood Hills or hills in California. Yeah, four days later I was in the car driving out here. Were you in St. Louis? I was in St. Louis. I was working for a lovely company developing shoes. Had a lot of security, and I think that was the problem for me. I wasn't ready for that amount of security and predictability in my life. And so I think when I had that dream, it was reflective of the inner turmoil I was having, but not expressing that I felt the need to go do something more for myself. 
I wanted to relate more to like the the bigger world. I wanted to be able to tell or be a part of telling the stories that matter to people. I didn't know in what way it would look. And then I just, I found Yoga Booty Ballet and I think it was this platform for me to express, connect with people in a very real, tangible, earthly way in a town where there's a lot of creation going on. What do you think about being comfortable versus contentment? That's something I've been thinking about lately. Mm -hmm. Asking myself, am I comfortable? Have I settled into comfort? Like some, I I don't think comfort's bad, but um, I don't, sometimes I wonder with myself if I've decided to be comfortable in a spot that's not something that I'm actually content with. Right. Personally, I find that I operate in phases. So there will be phases that I give myself license to chill and nest, have my TV marathons, like kind of nourish myself in that way. And then there are times that I'm really ready to go out and say to the universe, like, bring it on. And I just think wherever you are is is fine because chances are you're um, you're growing and expanding at the rate that's perfect for you Hmm. but that is if you're if you've opted into a life of seeking and Mm -hmm. education and growth did you go to university I did I got a degree in English I went to school to study education I wanted to be a grade school teacher my whole life I looked up to my aunt Kathy who was a second grade teacher and I just, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. So I went, I stayed in state for school because I had a great education program, University of Missouri, Columbia. And then halfway through, I had one of those moments similar to the dream where I was like, "Uh uh-oh, there's so much more I want to learn. So I switched my degree. I was able to graduate in four years with a minor in art. I almost got a minor in business, couldn't pass finance, which is weird because I'm the daughter of like a financial guy. (laughs) <laughs> I could not catch on to finance. I mean, my I would I would call home weekly. My dad and I would have little like tutoring sessions and couldn't just couldn't swing it. But I also took it senior year and I was like I had maybe 20 to 20 percent focus on finance, 80 percent focus on Bud Light. <laughs> I had such an ideal college experience like I was able to graduate with a degree in four years Um, I joined a sorority what was that like which was really weird because in high school I was pretty introverted and in college I like really came out of my shell it was like vice president of my sorority and like (laughs) loved it like spoke in front of like the chapter meetings every week and a huge house like 300 girls or whatnot and um what's the name of that sorority Oh, delta gamma it's a totally weird world, and I'm not even sure if I'm blessed with a daughter one day. I will encourage her to do it. Oh, gosh, that's a horrible thing to say. Um, I had such an awesome experience, but I think if done incorrectly or without perspective, it can be really jarring. And for those girls who go through recruitment and don't land in a house, it can be traumatizing Hmm. It's so it's so rough of a process. And I just don't believe in um, at that age, feeling like you're immediately being judged the second you get on campus Mm. and like needing to identify with something that said had such an amazing experience. And like the ability to kind of like start over in terms of defining myself Mm -hmm. was um, really cool. Because that means if they don't end up in a house, that means that they didn't, they weren't welcomed into the sorority. Yes. I just think that's horrible to go through a, a feeling of rejection when you're going into like a new place. There should be some sort of system in place that guarantees everyone will make it in. If they want to be in a house, they'll make it in. I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to put my own daughter through the process of being judged by other girls Mm-hmm. It's so opposite of what I'm about now. And yet at the same time, again, had the most amazing experience. I'm still friends with all of my friends from the sorority. For me, it was pivotal. Mm-hmm. I think. Had you always planned on joining a sorority or was it like you got there and they 
I mean, was that something talked about in your family? Oh, yeah. My grandma was a DG. So I grew up hearing stories about her and her beloved experience. And I moved into the house that she was. She was the first pledge class in the house, 1936. And I moved into that house in 1999. Mm. And she was photographed in the stairwell of that house. And that is the photo that my grandpa saw in the newspaper in the Kansas City Star. And told his friends, I'm going to marry that woman one day. Married her. And here we are. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Then with your mom and dad, like how did your mom and dad meet each at other? At the same school at Mizzou, at University of Missouri. They shared an apartment complex. And my mom was filling the oil in her 66 turquoise Mustang. And my dad was like, oh, hey, do you need help? And she's like, I'm just trying to figure out where to put this oil. And so he helped her and was like, what do you say about a movie? And she apparently she denied him three times. But not because she wasn't interested, but because she seriously had to study. She was very Mm. studious, very focused. Mm -hmm. She was like, I have a test tomorrow. I can't go on a date. And then I think he finally made her dinner one night and she agreed. Do you think that, could you back up a little bit and talk about when you... Because I, I still want to hear about how you even like got into dance. So how long have you been in L.A. now? It's been nine years. And I started teaching eight years ago. So within that first year, you found it. Yeah. How did you find it? Well, I'd moved out here with um, a guy. And we split up six months into it. And I was really lost. I mean, I was I didn't have a community out here. I didn't have really any friends. So the like the first job I got was answering phones at a spa. And I met my two first friends there. One was Kenny. He did the hair at the spa. And the other was Darcy. She ended up hiring me, but she managed the desk staff at the spa. To this day, they're like my other brother and sister in this life. And they really, really helped me along. So I go through this breakup. I'm totally disillusioned. I have my two friends my Kenny and my Darcy. And I lived in a studio on my own in West Hollywood. I didn't know at the time how much I needed just a sense of community or a sense of connection with other people. And then I came across a studio that was down the street from me. There was like music I could hear. And I, you know, it's like on the second floor. So I looked up and I like saw people dancing in there. And I came back the next day and took a class and I just like wept in the class. I was like, oh my gosh. And Gillian Clark, she's my teacher. She spoke directly to me and said, you know, welcome Kristen. She asked me for my name. She said, welcome. And um, I just knew this, this was, uh, this was the place I could go and sort out how I was even feeling. I just, I mean, there was a lot going on in my head and in my heart. And I was really confused Mm -hmm. what I was even doing in the world. But I found a sense of peace and freedom to be lost in that class. And then I just realized I wanted to do this all the time. Well, how long were you just dancing before you decided that you also wanted to teach that? Zero time. I did not dance at all. I was not one of those girls who grew up dancing. I just danced with my friends in college. We just would go out on the weekends and we dork out on the dance floor and I it was just one of my favorite things to do so then when I found the class I was like oh yeah this is this is definitely a good thing to have in life I just love dancing I feel like there are a lot of good dancers out there it's this thing we kind of innately know how to do and we may not have some of us may not have rhythm and some of us may not have technique but we all know what it feels like to dance and that we enjoy that. Why do you love dancing so much though? Um, As a physical movement, you are opening. With time, our bodies begin to round and close and dancing is the opposite of that. It's like, nope, I'm opening. I mean, that's a really gangster thing to do, to defy what's going on around you that could tempt you to close and instead to choose to open and to like just have fun right because you're also you have to get out of your head you can't operate from your left brain 
and have fun dancing. You have to kind of go super right brain and you have to shut off the ego. Hmm. I think Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. And that is a really healthy place. It's a really healthy practice. Hmm. It's like meditating. Do you, um, one of my questions that I wrote down was, um, do you consider yourself an empath? If you do, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I have been told that I am empathic and I have related to the term and the definition of it. Um, I've always known that I'm a hypersensitive person. I was told by a therapist along the line that I am I am the sponge, like every family has a sponge. So there's the family and then there's like the one character in the family who tends to absorb everything that's going on. And that person is definitely me and my family. So I'm someone who's absorbing energy all the time. And I'm, I am able to see pain in people pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a strong desire to want to help and to want to heal. And I'm not quick with my boundaries. I'm not quick with limiting how much I give somebody. But as I get older, I'm getting better and better and refining the tools that I need to be successful in my relationships. Yeah, I was wondering how do you keep balance in your life and like what have you discovered about yourself that are your needs to take care of your own emotional well-being? I have got to laugh. So studying comedy, studying improv has been one of the best things that's ever happened. So I take classes. I I took a round of classes at Second City and at Groundlings and at UCB. And then I went through the whole UCB program per suggestion of Darcy Carden, who is a YBBer. So studying comedy is that exercising, again, of like the right brain. Because I I just have, I think we all have such an ability to get in our heads, to get stuck there. And moving to the right brain, the creative place Mm -hmm. the place where like you just kind of trust your own innate knowledge and your innate essence instead of trying to answer all the questions of like how and well what am I doing Mm -hmm. so a couple years ago I realized how important that was and I started focusing more on it my friends back home they'll just laugh at me if I get too far out Mm mm-hmm and it just reminds me I need to laugh at myself, too. Hmm. But do, do you like laughing at yourself? I love laughing at myself. That's my happy place. Mm-hmm. And with dancing, too, like you, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you're totally dorking out, it's impossible mm-hmm. not to just crack up and be like, well, I mean, it is possible to not crack up. It's possible to get in your head and think that you look horrible or you're being silly or something. Yes. But when you yeah. embrace your inner dork, which we all have, man, you just let it let it flow. Mm-hmm. And doesn't that feel so good? Sometimes you just need permission to do that. Can you talk about your your big move that you have coming up here and how you made that choice to go? Sure. So um, after nine years of L.A., I felt – so my intentions have become progressively stronger as I've become stronger over the years. And the last couple of years I've called in – Uh, This is so personal. I can't believe I'm sharing this, but I've just called in, you know, the next chapter. I've wanted to call in my partner and my family, my future family. And um, because I love my existing family so much and I've wanted to spend more life with them, my sister um, and my niece and nephew, my niece and nephew are like everything to me. I, I adore them. I'm close with them. Life feels right when I'm when I'm with them. Giving love feels so much better than just focusing so much on myself and my path and like what I'm doing. It's just it just feels right. It feels correct at this point in my life to be opening up the door to more love, having a child, having a partner. So I started a couple of years ago calling that in and then basically doing all the work that was necessary to be able to hold it. And just recently, I met my partner. He actually saw me in a photo and was like, who is that? And then we we met and um, it was very clear. So he lives in New York 
And I was like, oh my gosh, well, this whole time you've just been like all the way over on the other coast. But um, (laughs) we're just so excited. Like we found each other in this lifetime. So it was just a matter of like, was he going to move here and or was I going to move there? And uh, my sister and the two kids that I'm so close to, um, my brother-in-law got got a new job in Boston. So they made the decision to go to Boston. And I was like, well, then I'm going to New York. It all just happened at the same time. And so my intention of family and partner and opening more love just showed up. You said that that he saw you in a photo. Mm hmm. And so you guys didn't know each other. We did not know each other. He is a friend of a friend. And actually the photo was of my, it was my friend Sam's photo, the one who I studied sound with. And she took a photo of me doing this, the sound training and put it on her blog. And he saw it and was like, who, who's your friend with the purple hair? Oh, and you had purple hair then. I had just dyed it. It was like I dyed it so that he could finally see me or something. So you're moving in the next couple months? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you moving to Manhattan? Moving to Manhattan. We just spent a whole lot of time looking at places in Brooklyn. And oh my gosh. I mean, Brooklyn's cool. But like apartment hunting in New York is ridiculous. I mean, it's it's like it is here. Like you're better off just waiting for a friend to move out of their place and taking over. But um, we just decided to stay in his place. And it's in a cool part of Manhattan. I really love Manhattan, actually. I wasn't expecting to, like, really love it. Mm-hmm. Love it so much. Um, so I'm intending to start YBB there in New York. Does start it have a community it yet there. at all? Nope. Oh, my gosh. And um, and start offering sound therapy there. And then I, I offer um, empowerment programs for girls, adolescents. Mm-hmm. So hopefully getting some relationships going with some schools out there and Mm -hmm. doing some of that so you're you know you're embarking on new beginnings in every yeah every sense every sense i mean i know i think i told you this when i first met you in your class i feel like you are light in la Hmm. and i feel like the city has been very fortunate very blessed to have had you here and you know maybe you feel that way about la to you in some respect but I'm really happy to share the light with New York City <laughs> Colleen what a lovely thing to say Thank it's you. true you're welcome but I, I think you know this what what you're starting I mean with like everything that you're talking about like with growth that is something that's happening in every avenue of your life right now I mean, I just I look at the trajectory of me and I look back on the Kristen who has gone through each of these little steps and phases. And I always just wish I had given myself a little more compassion in the Mm. in the places where I didn't have it all figured out because there will be moments like like right now I'm riding an amazing wave. And I'm not saying it's challengeless. I'm saying I mean, like there are definitely some challenges with all of this new stuff, but the clarity has arrived and I'm I I'm so grateful so having compassion for myself in every step of that process is important and the things that play a part are like making the consistent choice to dance making the consistent choice to release and heal making the consistent choice to um, meditate or pray Mm-hmm. And so um, it's all coming full circle. Like it's so interesting to talk with you right now about all of this stuff because as I do, as I go off into this whole new episode, mm-hmm. it's those tools that you just you've got to lean on. You got to just trust that you've got all the tools in your tool belt. Hmm. And like sometimes it means scheduling them in. Hmm. So mm-hmm. you're talking about being disciplined, I feel like, in some yeah. Right aspects. Yeah. Being disciplined. Like with, showing up, like, like meeting yourself. Yeah. Right? Like we develop these tools, but what good are they if we just like, how can you taste the flavor of the soup if you leave the ladle in it? Hmm. I think I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quote out of my Buddha, my like... <laughs> 
my like little Buddha manual. I feel like I need to find that thing and look up that page again. So the ladle's your tool mm-hmm. to taste the flavors of the soup, but like, what good is it if you're not using it? So it's like we develop these cool tools. We know we have the tools, but sometimes we just don't have the insight to use them, mm-hmm. or like we forget. Yeah, we forget that we even knew knew how to use those tools. Yeah. Like how effective is just daily giving yourself five minutes a day to just be like, okay, how am I doing? What's going on? Actually, let me ask you this one last question. Cause I, my, my last question on here is what has living in LA meant to you? Cause mm. I'm, I imagine it must be like a bittersweet goodbye in some ways. Actually, let me ask you a question. I ask strangers once in a while. Okay. Cause I really like talking to strangers and I ask them if they're an Angelino, I'll mm-hmm. say, do you think Los Angeles is a girl or a boy? <laughs> wow. Ooh, that's a toughie. I think Los Angeles is female in the sense that there are many, many dimensions and there is an undertow of spirit. But it's masculine in the sense that there's a lot of fire and there's a lot of burning going on. Um, a wise teacher once told me LA has the facade of a breezy beach town. But this is where people come to burn. And I do believe that LA has been that for me. I consider this where I got my master's degree of me. I came here for an advanced education of spirit and of who I was. And I know I will always continue on that journey. But I'm ready to step away from the flame. Maybe go towards another flame the flame of new york or whatever but um yeah la this is where people come to burn i mean this is where where people come to burn and you you gotta you gotta stay strong in the in the heat yeah did you know that california it means hot oven no i mean that's california it's not los angeles but still I think your teacher is pretty on with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're good. I want to say that um, I bless you, Kristen, on your next your next endeavor, your next chapter of life. And I bless you right back in this Thanks. journey of telling the bigger stories. <laughs> Thank you. And allowing people to tell their stories. Well, as good fortune would have it, and a bit of pounding the pavement, and working her little yoga booty ballet off, Kristen now teaches regularly in Brooklyn as well as Los Angeles. She also leads retreats and offers sound baths, which is actually what's playing underneath this. If you're thinking you'd like to attend one of Kristen's classes, retreats, or sound baths, go to www.feelsprettyawesome.com. Let me put that in a sentence for you. How does it feel? Well, it feels pretty awesome.com. There you can check out Kristen's current schedule and sync your schedule with hers. I promise you, your life will thank you for it. You can also follow Kristen on Instagram and get regular updates of her current classes at Feels Pretty Awesome. Cover art for Mostly Minutia by the ever lovely Eva Fan. You can find all musings by Eva at evafan.com. Lastly, links to all these are listed in the show's description, which you can find wherever you're currently listening to this episode. This episode of Mostly Minutia was recorded on location in Kristen's bedroom and at Epiphany Space in Hollywood, California. Epiphany Space is a nonprofit co-working space with quaint, cozy rooms and espresso for days. Rent a room for an event or work for the day at epiphanyspace.com. next time on Mostly Minutia. Kristen, so it's been about, let's see, August, 1, 2, September, October, November, December. Oh, uh, well, it's almost nine months. Yeah. Since we've s- spoken with each other. Yeah. It's been nine months. 
I last spoke with you in August, right before I was moving to New York, and I was um, stepping into this exciting chapter and exciting life change. And my partner and I started, um, well, we kind of encountered the challenge of living together in a small space. (laughs) So like you've got two people with two people's stuff in a small amount of space. And I think it's really important to have room to have the time that you need. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm articulating this very well. You know what my problem is right now? What? Feeling like I want to remain this very positive voice. The last time we spoke, I was so self-assured. I was so clear. I was embarking on something really amazing. And it's been amazing. But my perspective is very different now. And I feel hesitant to put on the record, like, that the story has to go that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel like, panicking right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Let's just stop for a second.